I would now like to welcome Dr. Donald Cohn. Dr. Cohn is a distinguished professor of microbiology, immunology, and molecular genetics, pediatrics, and molecular and medical pharmacology, and the director of the UCLA Human Gene and Cell Therapy Program. Welcome, Dr. Cohn. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, you know, I, I care very much about the IDF and skin patients, so I'm glad to have this opportunity to talk about gene therapy. Um, hopefully, I've kept the slides down to enough that I can talk at a relatively leisurely pace for me over a half hour and have plenty of time for questions. Okay, yeah, so this you. is just the introduction of uh, gene therapy for primary immune deficiencies. I'll, I'll mainly talk about skin, but I'll also comment on some other issues. So conflict of interest statement, this needs to be set up front. Um, some of the ADA skid work that I'll talk, out, talk about was developed by at UCLA by my group at University College London, and we patented it and we've licensed it to a company, Orchard Therapeutics. So I'm an inventor on that um, University of California intellectual property. I'm also on a number of scientific advisory boards, including Orchard Therapeutics that, that um, has ADA skid gene therapies. Um, and I've also done some ad hoc consulting that wasn't relevant to, to this. So just to start at the very beginning, you know, what is a gene? And so just to make sure everyone knows, inside a cell, inside the nucleus, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And chromosomes, if you unspool them, are the double helix of, of DNA. And one stretch of that that sort of has one packet of information, like information to make how one protein is a gene. And so you know, the, the primary immune deficiencies are due to inherited mutations in a gene needed for the immune system to function. And so, as you'll hear, so the idea of gene therapy is to give back the cell normal copy of that genetic information, either by adding it or by editing it. And we'll, that's what we'll talk about today. Uh, and so this kind of just is the point I just made, I guess, that the primary immune deficiencies um, are due to defects or mutations in the genes needed for the immune system to develop. Just move my pictures out of the way. Um, and so if a patient is born with a defect in a gene needed for the immune system, there, there are ways to overcome that. And one is in some cases to give the missing gene product. And so for example, in X-linked A-gamma globulinemia, where the problem is, is making antibodies, you can give immunoglobulin replacement therapy. So even you're not there, you're not actually fixing the gene, you're kind of working around it, replacing what's missing. But for a lot of the, the most severe diseases, the main way is to give a new source of the gene by giving healthy hematopoietic stem cells. And we'll, we'll talk about what hematopoietic stem cells are. And so this can either come from a healthy donor, a brother or sister, ideally, who's a match, or for those that don't have that match, then this idea of fixing the patient's own stem cell uh, has come about, and that's gene therapy. So gene-corrected self autologous, or meaning self-stem cells. And the two technical ways to fix the stem cells are either to add a copy of the gene, which is mainly what's being done, but sort of an emerging way of doing it, which I'll, I'll talk about, is to actually fix the gene, edit it right in its own chromosome. And, and so the reason that we're talking about gene therapy for these diseases is that one of the complications of doing a bone marrow transplant or a stem cell transplant from one person to another is this complication of graft versus host disease. Um, and so a major limitation to the use of hematopoietic stem cell transplant to treat primary immune deficiencies is the unwanted immune responses that may occur between the patient and the transplanted cells. So, you know, we think of people who get a kidney transplant, that patient can reject the transplanted kidney because it's foreign tissue. And the same thing can happen with stem cells. In skid patients, that's not much of an issue because their immune deficiency limits their ability to reject it. But what can happen is sort of the flip side where donor T cells that come along in the, the marrow or the graft can react in the new body there in the, in the recipient, and that's the graft versus the host or graft versus host disease. So therefore, we have to give immune suppression to try and get that under control, but complications can still occur. And so this is wouldn't happen if you had an identical twin, but then the identical twin would also have skid. This works, this is relatively low risk where there's an HLA match or fully matched sibling. Most patients don't have a matched sibling. And so if you go outside the family 
or use a parent, these risks are, are higher. Um, and so this is just at the bottom, just kind of symbolizing the sort of bi-directional immune reaction that can occur in a transplant setting. And, and to illustrate it, I, I, I use this slide. This is from a paper that was published now almost 10 years ago, looking back at patients at, at, with ADA skid in five transplant centers and what was their survival after transplant. And, and so first of all, it needs to be recognized that these then represent patients sort of from the 90s in the early 2000s. And we think transplant wise were better and that for all these categories, results would be better now. But this just kind of illustrates the point that at the top, these two rows are with about an 80 to 90% survival are patients that had a matched sibling donor or matched family donor. But as you go outside of that, either matched unrelated donors, someone, you know, not a family member, but someone who shares the major tissue types or a uh, haplo apparent, the results are lower because of these immune complications. And so for gene therapy, most of the effort has been to treat patients that don't have a matched sibling because the patients without a matched sibling have a worse outcome. And again, as I said, I think our current results are better than this. This is really, you know, two to three decade old data, but it's, it's the biggest study that uh, currently has been reported. And so all science needs a hypothesis. And so the hypothesis for gene therapy is that using the patient's own hematopoietic stem cells, which would then be autologous, that are corrected with the normal gene can have the same beneficial effects on blood cell production or function as a transplant from a donor without the immune complications of allogeneic or other person's stem cells. And so this is a slide that we always show some version of that is our, our, our interpretation of how blood cells are made. So on the right side of the panel are the mature blood cells that we see in circulation. And here's the lymphocytes that are you know, defective in SCID. And ultimately, all these different blood cells are made from hematopoietic stem cells. And in us, after we're born, these live in the bone marrow. And over time, they can either re reproduce themselves to sort of maintain the stem cell pool, or some of them then start changing and differentiating and becoming ultimately the mature blood cells. So all of these cells, other than the stem cells, have a finite lifespan of days to weeks to months but the stem cells are lifelong. And so that's why we talk about stem cell transplant. These are really the cells that when we take bone marrow from a sibling, for example, will in the new patient for the rest of their life make blood cells. And so the task then to sort of do gene therapy is to take the patient's own hematopoietic stem cells, insert or fix the gene, make the gene normal in those permanent stem cells. And then that gene will then be transmitted to all the blood cells that are produced and would ideally correct what was missing. And so, as I said, the two major approaches, and the main one that's been used to the present time is to add a copy of the gene, put it to a virus to infect it into the stem cell, but now emerging are, are methods with CRISPR that you may have heard of to actually edit the gene. And then just one more point on the slide at the bottom, it says CD34, the 1%. So about 1% of the cells in a bone marrow or a stem cell collection have this marker on their surface, CD34. So very often the first step once we get the stem cells from the patient is to collect the CD34 cells and get rid of these 99% mature cells that we're not really interested in fixing so that we've just sort of enriched the targets for the, for the gene correction. And that, that happens at the laboratory. And so to consider doing gene therapy for disease, these are, are some of the things that are needed. So first of all, we're talking about primary immune deficiencies that are caused by a single gene. So some immune deficiencies and other diseases, are, are, there are multiple genes involved, and that's going to be much harder to approach by gene therapy if you know, three genes with weaknesses in them conspire to make a disease. And so for most of the classic primary immune deficiencies, it is a single gene that's defective in, in the patients. And so therefore we can think about targeting to fix that gene. And then we need a method to deliver the gene to the cells and I'll talk about that. Now, once we've put the gene in, it needs to make its product, the messenger RNA and the protein at the right level. And obviously this needs to be safe and there have been some safety concerns with vectors that I'll talk about. And ultimately it's gonna be a marketplace thing. You know, is, is gene therapy more medically beneficial than the other options of transplants? or more cost-effective, and cost will be an issue with gene therapy. 
And so this slide sort of a cartoon of the procedure of gene therapies, which starts with the patient. And the first step then is to collect their stem cells. And that means either a bone marrow harvest or a stem cell collection. I'll explain those a little bit more. And so then we take their stem cells to our clean room laboratory. And in most cases, then we have a virus that was made from either a mouse retrovirus or an HIV lentivirus. And these viruses have the property of integrating to the chromosome. So in the laboratory, we've cloned in a normal healthy copy of the gene that the patient is missing. So then that virus can take that gene and add it to all the stem cells while we have them in the culture dish. Um, and so we would add gene addition to the stem cells, or as I talked about, you know, the emerging method is gene correction of the stem cells using CRISPR, which would be a site-specific nuclease that cuts in a specific place and a, a donor that has a normal sequence. And I'll, I'll show you that later. Once we fix the stem cell, or while we're fixing the stem cells, the patient is often given some chemotherapy to eliminate the rest of the stem cells in their body. You know, when we collect the stem cells, we're just taking a fraction. And if we don't give chemotherapy, we give these cells back, all the other cells sort of block it in grafting. And so we sort of talk about using the chemotherapy to make space so that when we give back these cells, they have a, a niche to, to grow in. So that, so that we just transplant the cells. And so this is a little more detail of this idea of using viruses to add genes to cells. So at the top is a diagram of one of these retro or lentiviruses into which we've cloned the ADA gene, the IL-2RG, whatever gene is needed for that patient. We then package that information inside the virus particle done in the laboratory in advance. And then these viruses have the property, they, they bind, this is the cell surface here, they bind to the surface and they inject their genetic information, which is actually a form of RNA. And then they have an enzyme that copies it into DNA. And then that DNA copy can get into the nucleus of the cell and integrate that gene right into the chromosome of the cell. So your gene is now a new gene, this gene we had in the virus, is now a new gene of this stem cell, and all the cells that it makes will inherit that same genetic information. So that's the, the basic process, and that was sort of developed kind of in the mid 80s and has evolved continually to, to hopefully get more effective and safer. Um, and, and so the other you know, rationale for thinking about gene therapy is that gene therapy using the patient's own stem cells, autologous stem cells, this should completely eliminate the risks of graft versus host disease since the, it's the patient's own cells that shouldn't see anything foreign to react against. And therefore, we don't need to give a lot of the medicines we give around a transplant. Part of the transplant condition in chemotherapy often is immune suppressive drugs, which we don't need to give. And often after transplant, patients are on immune suppressive medicines like cyclosporin, tacrolimus, and other things to prevent re rejection of graft versus host disease. All that's out. And, and so I think that really does contribute to gene therapy procedures being easier because there's less medicines being given. However, as I said, we still need to make space in the patient's marrow so these autologous stem cells can re engraft. And that involves giving chemotherapy. And that's you know, probably the major risk of, of the procedure. And so this is some diagrams I put together, sort of illustrating the process of gene therapy or bone marrow transplant. So it starts at the upper left. So there is a patient under those drapes face down, so laying on their stomach, and there are needles being inserted into the back of the pelvic bone to extract some bone marrow. And that's the way that bone marrow has been collected for 50 years. And so you can get enough bone marrow from the pelvic bone uh, on going on both sides for the transplant. So once those cells are collected, they're then taken to the laboratory where they're processed, as I talked about, to isolate the stem cells, put the gene into them. And then while that's going on, the patient will get some chemotherapy. And then the easiest part of the whole thing is giving the transplant, because it just goes in like a blood transfusion intravenously. You know, so usually the patients will have a pick line in place, and it's just given through that. The cells go around in the circulation, and it turns out that the bone marrow space is actually part of the circulation. There are arteries that, so eventually the stem cells will go there and lodge and start growing. And so to get the transplant is easy. The hard part is really getting over the chemotherapy. And so this is a patient that had a transplant. You can see there's lots of IVs in the background. So they're getting lots of medicines. 
and that the nurses and parents are, are wearing gowns and gloves and masks to protect the patient from getting infections. And so for about a month after the chemotherapy, the patients are quite vulnerable and need, you know, need relatively intensive support with antibiotics, intravenous feeding typically with, with a full transplant. And then I, I mentioned stem, blood stem cell collection. So in fact, for most transplants, we're no longer doing bone marrow harvest. We're getting the stem cells by another method. So it turns out that if you give someone GCSF, that's sold as the drug Neupogen, that is given after chemotherapy to raise the white count, if you give it five days in a row, and then there's another drug for that boosts it, it causes a lot of the stem cells to leave the bone marrow and go out into the blood. Um, and so then just by putting in two big IVs and running the patient's blood through a machine, you can actually skim off the stem cells. And so this shows that sort of the, the guts of this machine is a centrifuge that separates the cells by density. And the density where the stem cells are is collected and then everything else goes back to the patient. So in about a, a three to five hour procedure, the patient's blood, small parts of it are slowly go through this machine to collect the stem cells that have been chased into the blood. So this is what the, the product of that is, is a, is a collection, a bag that has uh, the patient's stem cells um, to be used for, for transplant. And this is probably easier. You know, if you've got a two-year-old child, having them sit still for three to five hours is, is challenging, uh, but it's probably still easier than going under anesthesia and having a bone marrow harvest. And so then uh, just a couple of pictures illustrating the process. There is someone's collection. I think this was actually a patient with sickle cell disease, so you get more red cells in the collection. And this is the CD34 selection device. We put in this mixture of cells, and when it's all done, we'll have a bag of just stem cells in it. And you see everyone's wearing their gowns and gloves and masks to protect the product in this case. So we work. We have special clean rooms where this is done. And then just a couple more pictures I, I've taken from recent transplants. So once the cells are, are processed to add the gene, now they're usually frozen in liquid nitrogen so they can stay there and be tested. And so this is a, the bed of a patient who's about to get a transplant in this little liquid nitrogen freezer are the patient's stem cell product that was made some weeks before. So it's brought over from the laboratory to the hospital. Here's nurse Lindsay ready for the transplant. She's got every possible tube, connector, or whatever is needed for the procedure. And then here is the bag with the stem cell product in it. So you can sort of see the, the line there. So that liquid there is saline that has the patient's stem cells and it was frozen. So it was just thought out. It's being drawn up into a syringe there. And then here is the actual patient getting gene therapy. So you can see we, we have this kind of complicated uh, connection that goes to the patient's pick line, their IV. And this is the saline flush that you can see is clear. And this is the stem cell product. So you can see it's cloudy and that cloudiness are the patient's stem cells in suspension. So this will be injected slowly through the IV line into the patient and then the flush uses to flush the syringe and that goes in two. So we've worked this out and it takes about ultimately giving the cells about five or 10 minutes. So it's, it's quite an easy procedure and the patients often have Benadryl so they're often asleep during the procedure. And, and so that's sort of the, you know, how it's done. And this is just one slide that I made a number of years ago that kind of illustrates what it looks like after a skid patient has had gene therapy. So this is a patient who was treated almost 10 years ago now. Um, and she had an older brother who had ADA skid. So we knew about her at birth. She was tested and found to have skid. She went on enzyme immediately and came for gene therapy when still quite young, three months of age. And we collected her stem cells and that's the number of, we had 6 million cells per kilo which is a good dose, we went between about three and 20. When we put the gene into them, we measured how many copies of the vector there were per cell. And it was an average of 2.7. We want to be between one and three, so that was good. We gave her her busulfan chemotherapy and measured the level of it, and we're shooting for about 5,000, so she was very close to that. So this is one where everything worked well. She was young, we got a good cell dose, the gene went into a lot of the stem cells. She got good, good chemotherapy levels. So she came in on enzyme therapy um, and so actually had recovered some lymphocytes. That's why she's got lymphocytes and T cell prior to gene therapy, which was done at time zero. We then stopped her enzymes. So actually the counts dropped 
But then over the next six to 12 months, everything came up. So blue is all the lymphocytes, uh, pink is the all the T cells, green is the CD4 T cells, blue is the CD8 T cells. Uh, that's the ADA activity in her blood, um, and that's her NK and B cells. So everything came up over time. And at two years, for example, this is looking at new T cells, naive versus memory. And she's got a lot of naive T cells marked by this marker CD45 RA. So that means even at two years, she's still making new T cells, which is what we want to see. And given her stem cells, the ability to make new T cells. So this is someone who's done very well. She's as she's almost 10 years old now and really has, has been well with, with no problems. And this is the, out, the outcome that we'd like to see in, in gene therapy patients. Um, and, and so in fact, one of the gene therapies that was developed in Milan, Italy, has been approved in Europe uh, by the European Medicine Agency, their equivalent of the FDA, uh, and it's marketed as a drug called Strimvelis by Orchard, the company that I, they have that I have their advisory board for. So they, they um, the group in, in Milan really pioneered the approach of giving chemotherapy and giving the cells and had enough re patient results that they were able to get approval. Um, and so this, this is marketed in Europe. It's not marketed in the US. Uh, and, and so sort of the era of gene therapy working sort of the late 1900s to 2000s um, in multiple trials, robust immune reconstitution was seen for XGID, for CGD in, in Wiscott Alder syndrome trials in Europe and then ADA skid in trials in Europe and the US. But then there were complications I'm sure many of you know about. So at this point, six of the original 20 x skid patients who got gene therapy with the mouse viruses developed basically T-cell leukemia from what the technical term vector-mediated insertional oncogenesis, meaning the vector caused leukemia because where it inserted. And I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. And then around that time, also in trials for CGD and Wiscott, again, they, the patients initially had immune reconstitution and cleared resistance infections, but then developed the same leukoproliferation or white cells growing leukemia, basically, in many of the patients. And this hadn't been seen in any of the more than 50 ADA skid patients who got basically the same treatment until very recently. And just recently, it was announced that one of the patients uh, who was treated in Milan with uh, with virus, the mouse virus, uh, developed T cell leukemia, just like was seen in the X skid. And so, you know, we, we thought that maybe it couldn't happen in ADA, but it, it does, although maybe it's less frequent. And and so, when these cases occurred in the middle in the early two thousands, kind of the field got put on hold while we tried to understand it and figure out how can we keep the benefits but make it safer. And so this is probably the most technical slide. So this is a sort of a diagram of a retrovirus. So this exogenous gene would be ADA, IL-2RG, whatever gene is needed in the patient. And it's put into this ends of a, a mouse virus. And this viruses at their ends have these strong control elements that drive to copy a lot of the messenger RNAs. It's called an enhancer and a promoter. And they were chosen initially because they would make a lot of the product we needed but these enhancer elements can turn on a nearby gene. So when we treat a million stem cells, the virus goes at a million different places. Each stem cell goes at a different place. And if in, in one cell it happens to be next to a cell growth gene, the virus can turn that gene on and that can lead to that expansion. And so since kind of the middle 2000s, all the new vectors that were developed don't have those enhancers. So they're called self-inactivating or syn vectors, and the gene is run off an internal promoter. And all the laboratory data said these viruses were going to be safer. They, we couldn't show them doing any problems to mice stem cells, for example, whereas the early generations could. And so we're now sort of in the lentiviral vector era, these newer viruses. So new trials have been done using these second generation vectors. And immune reconstitution has been achieved for patients with at least six diseases that, that I know of. So ADA skid and X skid and Artemis skid at UCSF, Wiscott Aldrich syndrome, XCGD and LAD1 have all treated, you know, anywhere from five to 50, 60 patients, uh, for, depending on the different diseases. And there have been no vector related complications using these second generation vectors. There's an asterisk there because 
There was a recent report of a case of leukemia developing in a patient with sickle cell disease getting gene therapy. And actually just like an hour ago, the company that did the study released their findings. And they don't think the vector was involved in causing it. So it suggests that the record still remains good. These viruses are relatively safe. You know, nothing is perfectly safe, but um, it doesn't seem that in this case, it doesn't seem there's any cases to the present time of these newer vectors causing complications. And so we've done a lot of work in collaboration with the colleagues at University College London, Great Ormond Street Hospital, Adrian Thrasher, Bobby Gaspar, and Claire Booth. And we made a lentiviral vector of that newer type where the enhancers are out of the, are, are removed. And so we just run the gene off an internal promoter that makes enough ADA messenger RNA to make enough protein to be beneficial. And so the group in London have done several trials where they've treated at least 20 patients We've done two trials. The first one, we treated 20 patients using cells fresh from the laboratory. So the day we're done putting the gene in, we walk those cells over to the hospital and give them to the patient. Then we did another trial where we did the same thing, but we froze the cells and gave them back to the patients. And we've analyzed and the results are the, exactly the same where they got fresh or frozen. The fresh is very helpful logistically because it gives you time to test the cells. They can be shipped from a company, for example, back to the site. So just to show a little bit of data from, from uh, this study. So this is uh, 20 of the patients who got the fresh cells, looking at how much ADA they're making in their red cells. And they had zero to begin with because of their ADA skid. After treatment, they now have slightly above normal levels of ADA. Their bad metabolites that build up in ADA are, are low. And over time, they made T cells and B cells. And of this group of, of the 20 patients that I talked about, 19 or 20 of them are off immunoglobulin, meaning they have enough B cell function um, to actually make antibodies and need, not need any um, immunoglobulin replacement or antibiotics. And so in fact, um, we just recently, we have a paper in press where we pooled the data of 50 patients who got that lentiviral vector I just showed you, uh, treated between our site and um, the site in London. And so we, were, we, were, we have a paper reporting the results in 50 of these patients where we took their stem cells, we transduced them with the vector that I showed you the map of after they got a uh, low dose busulfan. And uh, the, one of the first things reported is that 100% of it, this is a survival curve. And remember I showed you the skid ones, the transplant ones where some of them were down here. So 100% of the patients are alive um, three to five years out from, from gene therapy. And it worked in 48 of the 50. So we had one patient in this group who really never engrafted her stem cells and needed to go on back to enzyme and have a transplant. And one patient in London who got a very low cell dose also at, at a year, they declared that it hadn't worked and went back on enzyme and has had a transplant. So that's 96% success rate. So it's not perfect, but it, it's, you know, we think it's quite good, obviously. Um, so that's that's what I was going to say about skin. I want to say just a word about CGD and then uh, briefly talk about editing and try and I'll leave time for questions. In fact, maybe I'll even skip talking about editing or just cover very briefly. Um, so CGD is another primary immune deficiency where uh, the protein, these various proteins that are involved in killing bacteria are missing. And we've done trials using a lentiviral vector to drive that gene. And um, patients with CGD, can't kill bacteria and we have a dye that sort of they, they can in healthy people they can oxidize the dye and make it blue this, these are cells from a patient who had gene therapy he had actually been tested 10 years earlier and none of his cells could turn that dye blue after gene therapy and afterwards before gene therapy but after gene therapy he now has those positive cells and this is just sort of looking at the same thing with a fluorescent dye that he has about 30 35 percent of his neutrophils can activate the dye, and that means also can kill bacteria. And, and so, again, this slide sort of summarizes what's been done in the sort of the recent era of gene therapy. And so there have been trials for ADA skid with retros and then lentis, X skid with retros and then lentis, Artemis skid with lenti, CGD, Wiscott, and LAD um, at, you know, multiple centers around, around, this is just, I guess, U.S. Canada center. I don't, I don't have European sites in here. Uh, so just a word about gene editing, then I'll stop so we can talk about questions. 
And, and so the idea of gene editing is if a patient has a mutation, rather than adding a normal copy of the gene, can we actually fix that mutation? And it, it turns out the critical breakthrough is these enzymes like CRISPR can be programmed to cut the patient's DNA at the one site right next to the mutation. So you can design a CRISPR that out of the whole genome will recognize a site right near the mutation and, and cut the DNA. And when, D, when cells get cut DNA, they freak out. And they call the paramedics. And they very quickly try and fix it. And if you give them a piece of DNA that matches the cut site, but has the normal base instead of the mutation, the cell can use that to fix the break and incorporate the normal base in. So that's what gene editing is about. And we're doing that in, in the clinic coming up soon for sickle cell disease. And this may be used for multiple immune deficiencies. And let me, uh, so, so uh, this is just, you know, I have the list of what's been done. So this is just the list that I know off the top of my head of other primary immune deficiencies where there is research in the laboratory moving towards the clinic. So other forms of SCID, other primary immune deficiencies are all under study in, in many labs across the world to try and develop gene therapies. And so then just to conclude, so autologous transplant of gene-corrected stem cells for ADA SCID, as I showed you, has been safe and effective. Um, and these new vectors that showed improved safety profiles are in clinical trials for XGID, ADA SCID, Artemis, WSGOD, CGD, and LAD. And in all of those trials, they've shown good benefits for fixing the immune system, and there have been no vector-related complications. This probably is, you know, 150 patients or something between the 50 or 60 ADA skids, et cetera. Uh, and then I just mentioned at the end, approaches to direct gene correction by editing are being developed that may broaden the indications for a number of other primary immune deficiencies. Uh, but you know, the, the limits are unlike allo transplant where uh, one approach, so a cord blood or a bone marrow can treat any of the immune deficiencies because the healthy cells have all the genes. Autologous gene therapy requires development of a specific treatment for each genotype. So ADA skin, X skin, Artemis skin, RAG skin, each is a whole project to develop the virus for it, to do the safety testing, to do the clinical trials. And so it'll become an issue that the cost and time to develop these for the ultra rare diseases is a challenge. Um, and then, you know, ultimately, as I said, the risks from gene manipulation that I talked about will need to outweigh the risks from graft versus host disease and immune suppression and ultimately the most clinical and cost-effective approaches will prevail. So this is my group that does all of our research um, and these are our funding sources and these are our collaborators and I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohn, for sharing your wealth of knowledge about gene therapy for SCID. Um, if you have any other questions, you're always welcome to ask IDF. Um, go to primaryimmune.org slash ask-IDF and we can connect you with Dr. Cohn or any other experts to answer your questions about um, SCID or living with PI. I also just want to take this opportunity to mention uh, that I have some resources that you can utilize on your journey with SCID. Um, if you check out the SCID Compass website, you can find many of them there. This includes an updated IDF um, patient and family handbook with a new chapter on SCID, as well as many other resources that may be beneficial to parents and caregivers of children with SCID. And I just also want to mention that our next SCID Compass event will take place in April. Our 2021 SCID Compass Summit is a stakeholder meeting for parents and healthcare professionals. Um, it's two days of virtual meeting um, with presentations uh, that are showing the state of SCID in the U.S. now. Um, we have some presentations by Dr. Harry Malik on COVID-19 vaccines and SCID, some sessions on navigating family planning with SCID, um, updates on newborn screening for SCID and so much more. Um, it is free to join, so you can check out the SCID Compass website um, to register and learn more. And that will be April 29th and April 30th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And so thank you again from all of us at IDF for joining us today. Um, it's such a pleasure to have Dr. Cohn here and to provide this wealth of information with our SCID community. Um, so we look forward to seeing you again in April at our summit. And thank you, Dr. Dr. Cohn, and everyone have a great rest of your day.